thank you very much. I was um, sorry for the technical problems uh, in this year. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be with you, uh, finally, and uh, that you can hear me and that um, you can share this presentation with me. Um, as my long uh, friend, first of all, and then colleague, uh, Marcos, I said, I'm very happy to be with you. Congratulations for this um, uh, terrific uh, project. Uh, it was a great opportunity for me. This invitation was a great opportunity for me uh, to see what the EUBIX project does and how arts uh, are integrated in uh, this project. Uh, as uh, Paula said, uh, I am a researcher at the University of Thessaloniki. Uh, my specialty is on um, uh, characterizing uh, urban sustainability, but also uh, through my expertise in the Airbus uh, program, uh, I have been also studying about uh, European cohesion and the policies um, lately. Uh, so, this is why today's presentation um, that uh, I'm going to share with you uh, is on uh, cohesion. Uh, I will, the first part is a little bit more, more heavy. It's about the European policy on um, cohesion. But the second part, which I hope that we can enjoy at the end, is more light, more pleasant. So stay with me and I uh, hope that uh, you have any uh, concerns we can discuss at the end of this presentation. Um, oh, I will not be able to handle the slides at all. Okay. Sorry. Um, we are facing today great uh, challenges. Uh, rapid globalization, uh, a lot of competitive uh, pressures um, uh, due to environmental issues. Population changes from city to city and the migration of flows are is something that we encounter uh, more and more lately. Uh, also, a global climate change is a great issue, and rising um, prices and security are concerning about all the European cities. Uh, these are global challenges that concern all European cities, but there are different approaches on how we can handle these pressures. Um, there are a lot of disparities, there are a lot of differences, and a lot of different approaches on how each city and how each region you can deal with these challenges. Can we go uh, let's just very rapidly define that the Eurostat has developed a classification of territorial uh, units uh, for statistics. This is uh, called NATS. And the Polish policy, uh, policy of the European Union that um, is dedicated uh, to cohesion, takes into account the NATS two regions, which include from approximately 1 million to 3 million inhabitants, 3 million inhabitants. Uh, currently, there are uh, 274 um, national regions in the EU. Moving to the next slide. I have, um, uh, in order to say um, uh, this disparity that uh, I've talked before, uh, I have decided to very quickly go through three slides. This is the first one. Uh, but um, I don't want to do a lot of numbers. Uh, but I would like to to, to the, how the, the, the range of these parties. So with different colors, uh, you can see um, the different ranges of different regions around Europe uh, with regards to an index that is the globalization reliability index. Uh, an index is an indication, it's a number that is composed by other numbers. So this globalization index is based on estimated productivity, on employment rate, on high education rate and low education rate in 2020. The source is for this one of this figure and of the next ones, the next two ones, uh, so it's data that is valid and it's also that very recent, so to understand that uh, it, this has a basis to, to show that this part is not this part is not something theoretic that exists. It's something that the European Union monitors it. 
it's about globalization. Women do the next slide, but it is about um, um, demographic change. This is another indication. Again, you can see, just take a look on, on the range of the different colors around Europe, on the regions of Europe, to see that we really face different challenges. So this is another index, another number, another indicator composed by sub indicators, sub numbers, let's say, uh, based, on, based on estimated share of people aged uh, 65 and above in total population, based on the share of 48 in total population, and population decline in 2020. So this is an index that shows the graph change around the uh, regions of Europe. And we can see again how the, the dispersion, how different um, each uh, region in the European Union deals faces with demographic changes. And moving to the third uh, side, um, uh, that it is about uh, the climate change vulnerability index. Uh, here we can see again the colors. It's another very important indication. It's another index. index based on uh, change in population affected by the class, population in coastal areas below 5 meters, potential drop hazard, vulnerability of coastal features and during the to account temperature and precipitation changes. Again, you can see the differences in the colors. We really face different uh, problems. We have a lot of disparities, so the regions need to use different tools and they need also different economic support in order to deal with these um, uh, challenges. So we can move on to the next slide. Uh, which uh, also, if we, of course, I must say that uh, the data in this table is not very recent, while in the, in the previous figures the data was very recent. And however, it uh, really shows again how different the situation is in every region. Here we can see that the, in uh, 2020, in, sorry, the, in 2011, uh, the gender person as a percentage, uh, an average percentage of the EU at uh, 28, it, it was the, 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 the top number in Luxembourg was very uh, different than the uh, lowest number, the lowest percentage that encountered in Bulgaria. Uh, also, regarding the employment rate, and remember this is data, the employment rate is about data from 2013. Uh, in Sweden, now, now they are even lower in Greece. In Sweden, back then it was about um, 80% in Greece. It, it was 53, now I can reassure you that it's a much lower. Uh, while in the United States, the difference in such numbers is only 2.5, and in Japan it is 2. So, in the, uh, why do we have a European cohesion policy? Because we need to reduce disparities between different European regions and um, uh, to achieve, in order to achieve a balanced economic, social, and territorial development. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, the main, I will not stay long, I will just um, uh, say that uh, in order to reach uh, important goals uh, regarding job creation, business competitiveness, economic growth, sustainable development, and in order to improve citizens' quality of life, uh, the European Union has introduced a, a policy uh, in order to smoothen these disparities. And this is why. This is called cohesion policy because cohesion, with the term cohesion here, we mean that we want to, to be closer, we want to be uh, more, uh, to, to be able to face challenges with a more coherent way. So, cohesion policy was a strategy, was influenced by strategic papers, but at the end, it ended like a tool uh, to help other regions face um, in a common way the challenges. Moving on to the next slide, um, we can uh, uh, see that uh, the cohesion policy, in a schematic way, we can see that cohesion policy delivers Europe 2020 strategy. So as I said before, we have the strategy, 
and we have the, the policy. Um, the policy in order to obtain growth uh, through smart solutions, sustainable solution, solutions, and inclusive solutions. Social cohesion is um, uh, the, uh, inclusivity, the third uh, role that you see here, is linked with the cohesion because when we are living in a coherent society, we are all included. So we have great um, uh, we, we are more. We have uh, we achieve a better uh, social uh, cohesion. Inclusivity is linked uh, with uh, social cohesion here. Um, uh, approximately uh, 352 billion euros were spent uh, during the period 2014 until 2020. Um, in order to implement uh, the cohesion policy and smoothen these disparities around um, uh, Europe. Uh, moving on. Again, the mission is to reduce disparities and the objective, as we said before, and we showed that um, a figure is to promote to growth in lagging regions, the regions that are lagging behind, to improve competitiveness, to address problems with cross-border international spillovers. So moving on, um, just for the history, uh, for the first time, cohesion policy uh, that, as we said, delivers the Europe 2020 strategy, which is a very important uh, document, was launched in 2010. Uh, so it was like 10 years. Um, policy, policy that was going to be implemented in the next 10 years. So this is the perfect uh, moment now that we are uh, in mid-2020 uh, to make uh, this um, summary, let's say, this um, uh, uh, to, to see what has happened. And uh, we are standing at the moment where the new cohesion policy, as we're going to see in a moment, is being designed. So it was uh, launched in uh, 2010. As a follow-up to the Lisbon agenda, it is a strategy for smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. And as we said before, it is dedicated to the smart agenda. And what do we mean in smartness? We mean innovation, education, digital society. We mean that we need a sustainable sustainability agenda regarding climate, energy and mobility. And an inclusive agenda. And here, as we said before, we have social aspect, the social cohesion aspect. We need to face employment, uh, enhance the skills of uh, employees, we need to fight poverty, and to fight social exclusion. Moving on. I will again not stay long here. I will just want to say for the history that. Um, even, uh, even if I said before that uh, it, is, it dates back, it was born after the Lisbon agenda, the first um, aspect, uh, the first words about uh, cohesion were given in Rome in 1957. Moving on. We have how the cohesion policy. We said that we have strategy and we have a policy. But how is this policy? Parent, let's say, how is this policy um, perceived or received uh, in practice by the region? This is delivered through three funds. And the, so the cohesion policy funding is delivered uh, through the European Regional Development Fund, um, uh, which uh, together with the uh, European Social Fund uh, add up uh, to the region, uh, final cohesion fund. Uh, since the uh, EU by Lake is a European project, I can say that uh, the funding that partners get from the European Union um, origins from the European National Development Fund. And then partners have to give their own contribution, the national contribution through the European Social Fund. And then the, in total, we have the cohesion fund. Moving on. Uh, here the numbers and moving on again. Um, again, um, just shortly to stress out the fact that um, the level of investment is adapted to the level of development, meaning that the European Union monitors which regions are more developed 
and um, it uh, delivers uh, the funds in a way that is approximate, that is um, coherent to the level of uh, development. Moving forward, we will have uh, beyond, beyond time. Just for the history, the budget allocations per member state for, this, uh, for the past program period, as we say, for the years from 2014 to 2020. Here you can uh, see, um, of course, this material will be shared with you afterwards, so you can read more carefully. You can always come back and contact me with any questions. Here you can see the total EU allocation cohesion policy in billion euros. Um, so you can see the ranges between countries. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, the cohesion policy has thematic objectives, research innovation, information and communication technologies, competitiveness and SMEs, and low carbon economy. And these go together correspond to the smartness, to the, to the one, the object, one of the goals that we discussed before. Also, it um, uh, has a thematic objective combating uh, climate change, environment and resource efficiency, and sustainable transport. And this goes together with uh, the sustainability uh, goal. And finally, regarding the inclusiveness, the third goal of the cohesion policy, uh, it targets employment, mobility, social inclusion, better education, training, and better administration. And moving on. And it is delivered through different programs. Uh, for example, uh, EU by Lakes is a transnational program because regions between different nations uh, or, in, or in, uh, different regions. I think it should be a transnational uh, um, uh, program. Uh, but however, we also have cross border collaboration between uh, bordering uh, countries. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, we also have uh, the European Union also has mind uh, why designing how uh, to implement cohesion policy different macro regional strategies. So what do we mean by the term macro region? There are different macro regions: the Baltic region, the Danube region, and the Adriatic and Ionian region. So these are um, more than one region for more than one country. To the share specific challenges, uh, so the European Union um, try to give them the same push, let's say, in order to fight the common challenges in a coherent way. Now we're getting uh, closer to the most pleasant uh, part um, uh, of uh, the presentation. Uh, I always remember, I try to remember that um, uh, I have young artists in the audience, so I will try to uh, uh, pro provide some amusing mom moments at the end, and we all enjoy just a few, very few words about the structure of the new policy proposal. I don't want us again to get into the numbers. I just want to stress out that um, green, the um, let's say the the the, the, the darker green, the darkest green um, uh, part of this circle corresponds to the cohesion and values, and this corresponds to the biggest amount of money that's going to be spent for the next six years through the cohesion policy, which means. Which means that the cohesion means a lot for the European Union, and some money is going to be in the most money of the funds are going to be spent on that. Going on, moving on. The next slide. Now, we have talked a lot about policy. I was, I, I, in the beginning, I was wondering if I should put this uh, uh, slide in the beginning or if it's better to keep it in the middle. And I decided to keep it in the middle, the definition of social cohesion. Uh, we talked a lot about the disparities, disparities uh, about clim climate and how to mitigate climate, disparities about the environment, how to mitigate the environment. But we have also these great disparities about social um, uh, issues. So we need a cohesive society that works, that works. And what does that mean? It means that we need to all work 
to uh, towards the uh, well-being, that the society needs to work towards the well, the well-being of its members. It, it needs to fight exclusion and mar marginalization. It needs to create a sense of belonging, to promote trust, to offer its members an opportunity of upward mobility, rising from the lower to a higher social class or status or whatever for anybody personally means that I want to rise from a lower to a higher um, uh, class. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, I, I try to uh, demonstrate some ways on how we, we use real arts in order to promote social cohesion. And to promote social cohesion, what does it mean? Remember what we just said. Huh? How to make people um, uh, have a better well being, have a better sense of belonging, understand better their, their identity, uh, they can fight better poverty. Uh, so, how can arts promote social cohesion? So, one way to strengthen community cohesion and feelings of belonging is through implementing cultural and arts programs. Art and culture have really the ability to bring people together through shared experiences. This is why I really believe that the selection of this module for this specific uh, open air university was really well targeted. I, I, I see the, uh, we have a problem with the sound. Sorry to interrupt, Eleni, but uh, we are uh, hearing you really bad, and uh, I think we are missing lots of things that you are saying. So uh, maybe if we can turn off the video, it will help. Uh, it's just a suggestion, but. Uh... Okay, of Okay, thank you. Sorry. No, no, no problem. I just stopped it. Is okay. it better now? Let's see. Let's see. Let's try. Oh, oh, what a pity. Yes. Um, recent studies have, so, uh, have shown that art and culture... Can you hear me any better? Yes, much better. <laughs> At least for oh. me. Okay. So, uh, recent studies have shown that the art and the culture actually add to the job market, job creation, and therefore promote economic growth. Uh, programs with cultural significance, such as dance, music, painting, writing, and theater, enable individuals, especially youth, young people, to express their feelings and emotions. Uh, this positively contributes to their mental health and adds to their psychological development, helping them fashion their uh, position in uh, society. Uh, moving on again. Um, I tried to uh, um, make uh, this presentation also uh, a little bit more updated uh, with the current situation with COVID-19. Uh, so I try to find some um, uh, uh, slides, uh, to add some slides uh, regarding how people from different um, uh, areas of the world uh, have used arts in order to fight uh, uh, their feelings. I'm very glad to read that uh, you are uh, uh, you are better. Great. Oh, I'm so pleased. So um, here we can see a 14 years old girl from Sri Lanka, uh, Sandithi from Colombo, who says, before the lockdown, I used to draw fun and creative stuff. But after the lockdown, I started to draw the things I missed the most. So she drew a picture of a girl, if you can see uh, on your right hand corner. She drew a girl, a picture of a girl sitting apart wearing a face mask with dancers in the background. And she said of the, lock, of the lockdown, it has made me feel very lonely because I'm only a child. So this, this kid did it not only express her, her, her feelings uh, through uh, her art, through her favorite um, art uh, expression, maybe painting, but, also, uh, but she also made that feeling public. She, she, she shared that feeling. Moving on to the next slide. Um, 
I would like to share with you an act, uh, a movement uh, of UNESCO, maybe, maybe some of you would be interested in that. Uh, so UNESCO has launched uh, the Resiliarta movement, which among other things will consist of a series of global virtual debates with uh, renowned artists and uh, draw support for the cultural world uh, throughout the crisis. Let's not play that link now because I have better surprises for you next and I, I see that we are running out of time. So moving, moving on to the next uh, slide, please. Here again we can see um, a young, what a young artist uh, has uh, drawn. Uh, an artwork completed by Jamal Durant, uh, raising awareness on the COVID-19 pandemic again and the importance of social distancing. Again, expression of art uh, he tries to use, he uses um, his, um, this method of expression in order to express his loneliness and also he passes a message to the society and he brings society, uh, he, he, he delivers united to society, so that's very important. Uh, important. And moving on to the next slide. We sing and we sang a lot during the times of crisis. Why did we do that? Because music creates a sense of belonging and participation. That's what social cohesion does. And uh, uh, that, that's what social cohesion looks for, to, to create a better sense of belonging and participation, as we said. It is an antidote to the growing sense of alienation and isolation in society in general, even more so now we are being asked to actively practice social distancing and isolation. We were, now things are getting moving again, but we don't know what happens in the near future. Again. Social distancing and geographical isolation do not have to result in social isolation. In the face of a certain uncertainty and panic, music is a social balm of soothing anxiety, enhancing community connections and acting in defiance uh, of the threat to community spirit. Moving on to the next slide. Um, I would like, if possible, to um, again. We have, but we 